afternoon. My name is Liz Riesberg, and I welcome you back to this session, which is the final one of the day. Um, I want to thank Isesco and Dr. Salam Al-Malik for the invitation to come to Morocco and this beautiful country for this warm welcome that we've received here. Um, it's my first time in Morocco, and it's just wonderful being here. Um, so I thank you all for being so welcoming and patient with my lack of language, and um, I look forward to inter interacting with you. I want to say that this session, being the last of the day, is going to be a little bit different from the other sessions of the day. We're going to be very informal, and so I would encourage you, if you're sitting towards the back, since there are so few of us, we were hoping to have more interaction with you, so please feel free to come sit in these more comfortable chairs up front because there are a lot of openings. So I hope many of you will, will be brave and get up and move forward because we'd like to have questions and answers with you and it would be nice if you were all sitting a little bit closer to us. So don't be afraid, we're very nice. We won't do anything to embarrass you. So please, please, you can't be so comfortable sitting back there. Thank you. We've got some brave people. Please come, come move forward so that we can see you better and interact with you better. There's chairs at the very front. Really, they're much more comfortable. Okay, our session this afternoon is called Academia, Industry, Relationship, and Entrepreneurship for Women. Um, entrepreneurship can mean a lot of different things to different people. It can mean being innovative and creative and doing something different. It can mean starting your own business. And whether we're talking about, try, whenever we're talking about trying something different, we're talking about developing specific skills to be successful. So today I am very fortunate to be moderating a panel of exceptionally talented women who are going to offer you a few comments that will be brief. Then we're going to have a conversation among ourselves here on the stage and then invite you to participate. So I'm not going to spend time with, with biographies. You have in your program some information about each of our panelists and I'm just going to ask them to start talking and we will jump in. Can you hear me? Ah, that sounds good. Right. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Salam alaikum. It's good to be here. I'm Barbara Brittingham. Um, I am the um, retired president of the New England Commission of Higher Education, which accredits colleges and universities in the six states in the northeast of the U.S. Um, and we're very happy. I live in the Boston area. Um, Boston has its first woman mayor. And in January, we will be uh, inaugurating the first ele woman elected to be governor of Massachusetts. So it's a good time. Uh, and in preparing some remarks here uh, on the theme of entrepreneurship, I found a report that in the US, women started 49% of the new businesses in the US in 2021. And that number is up from 28% in 2019. So that's quite a change. So I want to talk about um, how five colleges and universities in the Boston area support entrepreneurship and their students learning that. Um, it, the institutions um, differ. It depends on their mission, what it is they're trying to do, and you'll hear different mi missions. It depends on whether they're looking only at business entrepreneurship or also social entrepreneurship, um, initiatives to address big problems in society. It depends on their student body, large or small, traditional age or adult returning students, and it depends on their capacity, meaning more or less how much money they have. And these institutions vary quite a bit along those dimensions. So the first example is Roxbury Community College, which, which is a two-year public institution in Boston. Um, it offers 24 degree programs and about six certificates. It offers a degree program in financial management for startup entrepreneurs. And also, uh, they've partnered with a group of lawyers to offer a certificate program for eight weeks for students who want to start businesses. It's typical of community colleges. 
um, in that they have degrees and certificate programs. Their president is Jackie Jenkins Scott, a woman, a black woman. The second institution is um, Babson University, which has about 2,500 students. It offers bachelor's and master's degree students, and it ha for 29 years, it has been ranked as the number one entrepreneurial institution in the US. Um, they, they, uh, mission includes preparing students and empowering entrepreneurial leaders who will create, grow, and st steward uh, sustainable economic and social value institutions. <clears throat> I know a second year student there. He happens to be the son of Amin Ben Said, who is president of Al Khwain University here in Morocco. Um, his second year, and I wrote to him and I said, I'm going to be speaking at this conference. Could you tell me what you learned your first year? And he said, I came to Boston with the idea that entrepreneurs are extremely creative people with it ready to take on big tasks, fail, 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 and then maybe succeed. My first year didn't give me the mysterious key to entrepreneurial success that I was expecting, and instead, starting my own venture, because they do this, students prepare that they start an entrepreneurial venture in their first year, fundamentally changed my ideas about entrepreneurship. I think the very process I went through summarizes my perspective on entrepreneurship. It's not about having unique ideas and mas mastering risk. It's about challenging all the preconceptions around you until you reach a mindset where problems become opportunities, fear becomes a driver for action, and you are ready to lead change. I think you'll do well. Babson College on its website, babson.edu, has 25 ways for alumni to volunteer to help current students. And they include uh, being a social innovation partner, um, doing management consulting for field experiences for students. They have a Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership programs, and they have something called the Babson Board Fellows, where students and recent graduates serve on nonprofit boards, bringing their skills and also learning about how boards work. The third institution is Olin College of Engineering. They have their second president. They're very new. Her name is Gilda Barbino. Barbino. She is a woman. She is a black woman. <clears throat> Olin College of Engineering was chartered in 1997 with a very large grant from a foundation to change how engineering education worked. They have about 400 students. They're all undergraduates, and 52% of them are women. Its mission is transforming in engineering education toward a world in which engineering serves everyone. Um, one of the things that students do, and they do project work from the very beginning, faculty work with faculty, faculty work with students, students work with students. In their senior year, students take something called the Affordable Design and Entrepreneurship Program, and they work with students from Babson College, which is very nearby. More about that in a minute. <coughs> The fourth institution is Wellesley College, also located near, <laughs> near Babson and near Olin, and its president is Paula Johnson, a woman, a black woman. Wellesley College is a liberal arts college for women. There are about 35 of those left in the US. They have about 2,300 undergraduates. Because it's liberal arts, it doesn't specifically have degree programs or even minors in business or entrepreneurship, but they do have a career education center which has a, a staff person who's dedicated to working with students who want to become entrepreneurs. They have something called We Start, which is an entrepreneurship club, and they have w women, w Wellesley Women in Business. Now, the three of those institutions, Babson, Olin, and Wellesley, have started something together called BOW, which stands for Babson, w o Olin, and Wellesley. Students can cross-register and take courses from each other, that they can cross dine, they have student organizations, uh, they have a bike share program, so this is entrepreneurial. The fifth institution is MIT, ranked number two in entrepreneurship. 48% of the students are women, and their incoming president is Sally Kornbluth, a woman. I want to conclude, and I could say more, <laughs> by, where'd it go? Quoting something I found in something called science.org, which talks about entrepreneurship. Uh, and this is William Bygrove, who's professor of free enterprise at Babson College. Entrepreneurship is the, quote, liberal arts of a business education. In contrast to a vocational education, which trains students for specific occupations and crafts, a liberal arts education educates individuals to be free to do whatever they find to be interesting 
It challenges students to behave both as generalists and specialists, to be creators and creative problem solvers rather than dreamers, to reason conceptually but implement pragmatically, perhaps above all else, it encourages students to be independent thinkers, to become entrepreneurial leaders. There is no finer education in the management sciences. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's the post-lunch dip, so I need you to wake up a little. <laughs> Okay, it's a real pleasure to be here today, really, in this beautiful country and in a country that is the founding country for female education and female universities. I am absolutely privileged to share a stage which is with such leading female leaders, so I feel completely in awe of um, the whole thing, and I feel um, the imposter syndrome coming up a little on me now, but... Um, We've got a timer going, and Liz, I am told, has a whip. <laughs> okay, so in, the, um, in, the, in an effort to keep things um, short and brief, I'm going to try and focus on three things, or three main points, zoom in on them, to help us think about this idea of linking education and, um, sorry, academia and industry. So the first point, being an academic, I always need to contextualize what I'm talking about. So the first point is, thinking about it, university education has um, developed very little over the thousand years that we've had it. If you think about it, universities have been around for over a thousand years in pretty much the same shape and form they've always been in. So it tends to be a wise man teaching younger, less wise men, right? So, and it was an apprenticeship. It is a way of, you know, sharing wisdom, the sage on the stage um, approach. And it was only very recently that us women came into this picture. And, you know, about 150 years ago, maybe uh, there were some women introduced. The real kind of push of women being in higher education is actually a very recent phenomenon. So that's something to just hold into our thinking in terms of the context. The other area of importance is this idea that actually the metrics which we measure ourselves against have changed significantly in the very recent history. So previously, we were not measured uh, on our employability rates. We were not necessarily measured on our staff-student ratios. And we definitely were not measured by um, rankings. With all due respect to anybody who works on rankings here, I better be careful. But, you know, the first rankings really came into play about 20 years ago. And that's really, really recent. So I'm just thinking... And, and now we suddenly want industry to take an interest in us and, and work with us and take our students. And all these years, we've not really built anything based on a collaborative approach with industry. So there is an element of trust here that we need to be conscious of. So that's the kind of the first contextual point I wanted to hit on. I guess the second is the game has changed, right? The game has completely changed in terms of the, um, what is expected of a university. And, and arguably, we may be going through an ident a change of identity in, in terms of what do universities do? Why are we here? What is our role? And I have to say, I am very proud and really, really very privileged to be heading a university that is completely dedicated, day in, day out. Every activity is centered around the advancement of women. I head a university called the Royal University for Women in Bahrain, and everything we do is around the advancement of women. So that makes it a little bit easier for us because um, that is our main purpose, that is our main mission. For many other universities where it is a co-educational setup, um, the historic um, presence of men in the world of work does overtake women, and, and therefore the challenge is a little bit bigger. So. The game has changed. We are measured against how many of our students are in full-time employment in a relevant discipline six months after graduation or something of that kind. Yeah? So how do we do that and how do we ensure that we build industry partnerships that are um, relevant, that are robust, that builds that trust and the bridge 
between the industry and the academic partner. Um, and I think this is something that, um, I have to be very diplomatic, I guess, here, but we struggle as university leaders. Do I have to be diplomatic? <laughs> no? Okay, I, I, can, I can be honest. I do think there is a, a little bit of an ivory tower um, approach. You know, we know it all. We, you know, we are the university professors. They should listen to us. Well, actually, they've got the money, and they're going to employ our students. So maybe we should get off our high horses and work with industry a bit more seriously. So, so that's kind of in terms of the realities of the world in which we operate. I have to share with you, I come from industry. So this is my second career. I used to be a project manager in financial services. So I've learned the hard way, I guess, that um, you know, money talks, and if you've got the money, you run the books. You know, that, that's how it works. So um, how do we build those bridges so that we can all benefit, particularly our young women or our women, uh, for that um, matter, whether they're young or they're more mature in, in their careers, how do we make it work for them? So I've got a couple of suggestions, and I will wrap up very soon to allow the floor to others. The first one, whoa, one minute, right, okay. The first one is about much longer internships. I know many of us claim that we have internships for students, fantastic. Six weeks, eight weeks, not enough for the industry partner to invest the, the student may learn, but the industry partner, it's hard for them to invest in training and teaching the student if it takes them three weeks to figure out where the bathrooms are or to figure out how to use the, the coffee machine. We need longer internships, so it is worth their while for them to invest in training these students, in mentoring them. That's number one. Number two, and I may lose some serious friends here, we need to get staff into industry, academic staff into industry periodically. I think many of us career academics spend far too long away from what is happening in the real world. I think there is a, a, a leaf to be taken from medicine um, where you know the, the academic doctors actually spend some time in, in the hospitals. In many disciplines, this is very important. So for us in business, we don't do enough of that. We don't actually work with companies closely. And there is a real opportunity to um, help academics do this. And there's a lovely little model, which I won't explain too much, uh, that happens in the UK. It's called a Knowledge Transfer Partnership, a KTP, which you know uses a tripartite arrangement between academia, industry, and uh, an associate to transfer knowledge two ways between industry and academia and academia and industry. And the final point I would say is, I think we need to pull in our sympathetic men around us. And I think somebody mentioned this in the previous session. I do think that many of those um, initiatives and institutions, etc., set up to help women tend to preach to the converted. You will find that the board is all women and the initiative is all women. And you're not pulling in some, unfortunately, some of the male decision makers. So we need to give them space with us. You know, this is a journey we're going on together. So it'd be lovely to see more sympathetic men, you know, around us, supporting us. And there are many of them. So I do hope we can unpick and unpack those few ideas, um, as, you know, throughout the rest of this session. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum jamian, masa al khair. My name is Najah Hashri. I am the Vice President of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST. I'm also a founding member, very proud of that. It's a huge university, a research dedicated university in Saudi Arabia, it's a tiny town, fishing village called Thuwal where we have become a town over time, uh, where we have, look, uh, we have, we're, where we are working, sh we we're working together with the top institutes around the, uh, the world to do research for the benefit of humanity. Huge, wonderful vision where resources are being put together for sustainable future for us all. Having said that, I would say truly the future is very different than anything that we have seen before. Our reality is so different from any reality that humans have experienced before. In fact, I would even go as much as humans are changing and humans 
are changing and you can see it in your children and the young and the youth around you so there are so many things that are taking hold in our reality not only post the, the pandemic so for example we speak about the recession coming up the very very much a very sluggish productivity productivity growth the most significant skill shortages that we have seen ever the massive demographic shifts and the complex array of social and environmental challenges we know we know it we feel it we see the changes none of us met here today didn't say something about how weather has changed either became too severe or too mild none of us have spoken without mentioning something about the ai ai and how it's impacting lives about our youth about tiktok about what's happening in the in around us right so we speak about universities and we speak and the name the title of the session is the relationship between governments and industry and uh, and the ro the role of women entrepreneurs in it I would like to introduce a different, a, a different framework for this. I probably would like to introduce government into this, and normally there is a framework called the triple helix, and it has those three entities, uh, universities, academia, uh, government, as well as industry. And this framework is really important for policymakers. We cannot say the issue of women in higher education or women empowerment or equity is a situation of culture only because we have already addressed all issues related to policies or regulations. So we have to introduce all three players to ensure that we're addressing the issues that we are facing in, in our economies today. The benefit for us, for definitely the benefits for, the benefit for uh, for universities is of course the opportunity to get funding, the opportunity to work on real world research, the opportunity to get access to talent and access to research infrastructure. It may play both direction, but sometimes when universities work with big companies, they have access to research infrastructure that they cannot own on their own, independent from the big or corporation. Think of Aramco for Saudis, think of Lockheed Martin, for example, globally. Uh, for industry, definitely there is a lot that they can gain. They can improve their performance by discovering new methods, developing innovative technologies, de-risking research. They can shift the risk over to companies. And they also have extend, extend their, their, uh, their reach to talent, to capabilities, to new skills, and to Im incorporate that. For Governments, it's very simple. For governments, it's about economic growth and diversification. There is a nice statistic that I like to share with you where it's, uh, it says that it's a Deloitte study. It says that for every 50,000 graduates, a university produces an additional 1.8 billion, billion dollars in annual economic activity is generated. The economic value and contribution of universities is demonstrated through another piece of, of uh, quantifiable evidence. Every one dollar invested in higher education results in five dollars return in the gross domestic product, in the GDP of the country. So we're talking about massive, massive um, impact for the economy. Um, the, the idea that we, I, I, I have a lot that I can talk about here, but I do want to go on to say how does, how do company and um, Yusra, Dr. Yusra just alluded to this relationship. How do we define this relationship? I want to say that we know universities work with companies. That's a fact. Universities do work with companies. What I'm actually arguing is that the normal, the standard, the traditional models of universities working with industry no longer fits the new realities I just described. Our, our, the youth no longer wants to spend their day in the office. They want the flexible work. They want the, uh, the virtual work. So that's one example. But there are other examples where we cannot use applied science, the result of applied sciences, which is a solution seeking a problem as a way to talk to, gov to industry. We cannot develop an answer, one solution that fits all and give it to industry. There is a need to redefine the relationship between government, industry, and industry, government, and uh, on one side, industry and universities on the other. I do argue for a need for further closer, closer work between universities and industry in terms of having academics engage and understand the issues. We have teams, interdisciplinary teams, 
to address issues of, of interest for both, but also there is a huge role for government that the big ecosystem, the ecosystem cannot be resolved by institu academic institutions or by individual uh, uh, companies, no matter how, how large the industry partner is. Uh, one of the examples that comes to mind, and I'm not bragging about my country, but it really is a very good example, where the players, the big players in this arena, this triple helix area, have been put together through um, some form of an ecosystem management tool. It's called, in Saudi Arabia, we call it the research, development, and innovation uh, you want to call it ecosystem, you want to call it whatever, but it's a research, development, and innovation body where the big players are connected, dotted lines, not connected with strict lines, just dotted line, and the university, but uh, the government, but all of those incentives to start looking at SMEs, to remove structural barriers, to empower women, and you saw Dr. Ima, uh, Dr. Inas's presentation, all of those measures to remove barriers and to, and to just be, you know, like doing the cheerleading to support the ecosystem from grounds up, connecting the players and giving incentives for those players to play together and to play nice. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum uh, and a very good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Professor Dr. Shahana Uruj Kazmi, Vice Chancellor of Women University, Sawabi, uh, from the province of Pakistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, in uh, first of all, I'd like to thank ISISCO and uh, uh, Princess Noura University, uh, who have arranged this wonderful gathering of. Uh, uh, women leadership all from all over the world, and it's really nice to interact with each of you. Uh, most of the things that I would say about the uh, industry-academia relationship, I think, uh, already have been pointed out in detail, but uh, there are a few things that I would like to just highlight, just two, three points, because there we have very little time. <laughs> Liz has already is looking at me. Uh, so I come from uh, Pakistan. You know that Pakistan is the second largest Muslim country of the world. And we have 222 million uh, people in our country. And uh, out of this, more than 51% are females. Uh, and uh, female education is very, very important. Literacy rate in general for female is quite high because they have started going to higher education and other institutions and formal training programs, etc. So literacy rate is about 51%, but in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, it's only 38%. Uh, and according to different surveys that we have carried out in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa about uh, uh, women in business or the you know, relationship between the industry and different universities, we found that uh, very, uh, you know, it's still very weak uh, because uh, things are in the developmental stage. Uh, but what I want uh, to just uh, convey here is the fact that uh, Wherever we see more educated women and with who have received formal education, they are more successful in business area. They have developed their own business. So lots of ladies have come up with uh, very good and very successful business areas. But uh, for this, I think uh, the uh, survey is not really reflective of what's happening uh, because uh, the training programs are not there. And realizing the fact that business and entrepreneurship is now the talk of the day, a number of universities have now started introducing uh, special training programs and they have developed uh, entrepreneurial project uh, modules and also especially emphasizing on financial and uh, marketing modules. So uh, in order to have a very good uh, relationship with the industry, government, and the academia, I think we need to have a multi-dimensional uh, approach in developing this relationship between academia and industry. And this can play a very critical role, especially in, the, in Pakistan or in some of the developing countries. We've been talking about the global picture and uh, list of uh, universities which are producing a lot of uh, spin-off companies, etc. But it's different in some of the other countries. So I feel that uh, you know this can play a critical role in the sense that universities are not well financed 
and they don't have the state of the art equipment, et cetera. So if we interact with the industry and have a good relationship, then we can have you know, different uh, uh, research projects, joint research projects, and additional resources, and also the transfer of technology, because we do uh, research in the universities, but it never goes to the industry. So if we have a better relationship, I think this can effectively contribute to the industrial workforce development with skills. Unfortunately, uh, in Pakistan, we don't have the required system and you know, uh, some policies for effective partnership between industry and academia, so the local industries, and that is why women universities do not have much relationship with the industry. Some of them may, may have, but uh, I'm coming from KPK, which is a very conservative uh, province. You know, Women are not even allowed to go to co-education institutions, and so the relationship between the industry is still coming up. So what I, in order to, you know, our uh, graduates and uh, research is always criticized. The graduates that we are churning out and the research that is coming out to the industry is irrelevant to the industry. So this mismatch has really created a problem and a big challenge. So the, the kind of knowledge and the skills which are required by the industry and by the and government institutions is not being provided. And this is because there is a lack of relationship between the industry and the academia. So if we interact more with them, we invite them for different sessions, we have you know, joint projects, and then you know, it can also help our students to get long-term internships in their industry and our staff also get uh, you know, trained. One of the problems that I was just discussing with Yusra also, the faculty has to be trained on entrepreneurship. You know, this is very important. So they can transfer that knowledge to the students so the students can become better uh, you know, uh, in their uh, uh, entrepreneurial projects. So at Women University Sababi, which is, I said, uh, that uh, it's in a very uh, remote province of Pakistan, uh, we have, uh, you know, started, uh, we have developed some uh, special entrepreneurial training programs and we are encouraged our girls to come up with new ideas and they're participating in business development programs and they're interacting with different industry. And with the help of the industry, we have been able to develop uh, an alumni business incubation center where our girls are putting up their, uh, you know, business ideas and they're maturing in them and then we want them to go to the market and establish their brands. So this, uh, uh, I think, industry academia relationship can have very potential good effects on the industry as well as the research. So whatever research we are doing, if we have them on our board of studies, in our syndicate, in our senate, with the industry and the government, then we will be churning out graduates who will be useful for the industry, who will be really doing things. And we will also be transforming the research that we are doing in the universities to the industry. The products and technologies can go to the industry, and that is going to help in the uh, promotion of the economic and social problems that the country is facing. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Zabir Al Harbi from uh, University of King Saud University. I am a professor of mathematics, so you have to bear with me. Some math is gonna be appearing here, and um, um, I'm a founder in the National Observatory for Women. Uh, this idea that we had after the vision 2017 came out and all these um, supportive legislation that was coming to support women in Saudi Arabia, um, th uh, there was something missing in, in that formula. Uh, things were expected of women, but there was no numbers that support uh, women. And that th that's was the major idea about the National Observatory for Women. We wanted an entity that calculates and measures and sees what's the ground base that we are working on in Saudi Arabia. Are women getting the privilege? Are they getting these uh, uh, opportunities that the government is giving to us? Is the numbers that come out from the education reflected on the market or not? And these uh, uh, delicate issues need to be calculated and need to be measured. So a group of us uh, uh, in mathematics, statistics, and other areas of social studies, we uh, uh, worked together. We made up this idea of having an index that reflects our needs. 
the index, um, we called it uh, the Saudi Women in Development Index. Um, it, it is the major project that comes out of the National Observatory of Women. And um, uh, as I said, the major idea for the National Observatory of Women is that the numbers that are coming from the education, they're not going into the industry. Something was wrong. And the only way you can uh, tell wh wh what to do is to have the right numbers and the right equations to measure that. And that was our area. So I'm just going to go to the... Um, uh, the construction of the index. Now we looked at international indexes like the Global Gender Gap Index. We like that. It, it, it is, it's talking about four uh, major uh, pillars that we you can measure uh, the performance of women through it or f gender in, in general. And it was education, health, economy, and uh, legislation. Now that sounds good for us, but still there's something missing. In Saudi Arabia, we know that it, this, these are not the only major uh, 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 players in, in, the, in where women go to specialize or where women go to work. We found that um, there is a, a fifth pillar that had to be added, and that, that was our input. We wanted to add the social aspect. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, a uh, lot of women are affected by social aspects, and they respect that, and that affects their uh, uh, future in terms of what, what to study and what to, um, to even work. If they get a, a job offer in another city, they have to check with their uh, families, and all these, uh, maybe for other countries, it, it's not an issue, but for us it is. And we were bold women. We wanted to measure that. We wanted to put our hands on, on the spot and see whether it is an issue or not. Uh, we didn't want our index to reflect uh, uh, numbers that were not realistic or, or not be useful. We wanted our index to be robust, at the same time sensitive, and measuring our needs. That's why uh, the we customized this index, and the index uh, was worked by national uh, experts from Saudi Arabia, from our universities, from the, our industry. Um, in, in every pillar, we had uh, an experts from the field. When we talk about education, we went to the Ministry of Education and, and had meetings with them to get to the, to the right components that we should measure inside the index. Our index had five pillars, as you can see. We, uh, we aggregated into one number uh, for, for Saudi Arabia. Then we were um, a bit uh, 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 optimistic, so we said no, not just Saudi Arabia. We want 13 districts of Saudi Arabia. We want to measure it in, in all 13 districts, S just to check whether the numbers are the same everywhere, or is it in a major city, it's different than small towns. So we needed to know that, we needed to know this information. So we, we split it into 13 districts, Similar to the GGI, how it splits it into 142 countries, we did it in, on Saudi Arabia for 13 districts. And that made sense more. It, it, the, the components were making sense more. Now, now the regions can compare to each other. Maybe the regions can, if there's a best practice in one area, the other region can get the lessons and, and start to, to spread that there. Also, if there is, uh, if there is um, uh, good um, a practice somewhere, it could be generalized in all areas. And, co you know, competition is nice. Y y you get better results with competition. So what we did is we, this is our map, and these are the 13 districts, and we got the numbers. Um, first, in 2018, it was pilot test, so not all the pillars were, were complete, not all the components we didn't have, but we wanted to see some numbers. Again, mathematicians and data, so you, you have to see magic. So we started to work with that. Then in 2019, we got uh, the, the, some authorities are coming with us. The, the National Statistic Authority came on board and they gave us da data and we started to work. And a lot of magic is, was coming out and we got numbers for Saudi Arabia and now for uh, districts. And uh, a lot of people were asking about our numbers. Um, so if we see this, uh, I'm not going to talk about all five pillars because of our session. I'm only going to talk about education and economy because at the end of the day, 
if you want to support economy, you have to have the right education for it. And in our pillar, in our uh, index, we have two pillars, and um, we can even study and analyze the coloration between these two pillars. And we have a website that, that we published the index in, and we can give grant access to uh, decision makers, to researchers, to use our index. At the end, uh, you know, we want our knowledge to be shared by everyone. What they can do with the index, that they, ca they can plug in their numbers and try what happens if, we, if I raise the education? What happens the effect on economy? What about health? What about uh, legislation? Do, do um, policies help uh, in, in adding more entrepreneurship women in the economy? All these questions can be answered by our index. So if you have the right tool and you have the right knowledge and you give it to the, the right people, a lot of things are going to come out of it. And that, that is the idea of, uh, of our index. And uh, so in um, um, the, organize, uh, the five pillars, if, if I, I can jump, yeah, this one, the educational pillar, the, it had two sections. One about the infrastructure, how much did our government put uh, in education, and, uh, and um, thank God uh, 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 our numbers in that area is, uh, is very high. There is no gender gap in education in Saudi Arabia uh, between uh, uh, women and men. They have the same opportunity to study and, and, and scholarships they can go in. And the other part is the outcomes. Uh, of the education. We wanted to see STEM. We wanted to see how many graduates are going into the industry. And that, is our, uh, that was our pillar. We can see that we scored uh, uh, in, the, in our uh, first round uh, of, the, of the index. Uh, we, st we scored very high, and that was uh, uh, expectable uh, from us. Then we went into the economic pillar, and it had six uh, components. Uh, entrepreneurship, as, uh, which is the idea of our talk. Also, how many workers are in the public sector, in the uh, private sector? Um, is there a difference in wages? All of that issues we, we, we measured. And we measured it in all uh, over uh, Saudi Arabia so that we can compare. Um, and this is the, um, the map. We can see that all uh, the 13 districts can compare each other and they can um, uh, spread the knowledge. Um, at the end of the day, what we wanted with, with this index is to give this tool to the right people, to the decision makers, so they can use it and g make strategic plans for our women so that they can enter the industry with, with brave uh, uh, hearts. And uh, since the policies are there and the support of the government is there, so it's just up to the women to go into that field and uh, uh, break the ice. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for the time. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. جميلة العلمي، je suis professeur d'enseignement supérieur et directrice du Centre national pour la recherche scientifique et technique. Tout d'abord, euh, je suis ravie et honorée d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui et je tiens à féliciter l'ICESCO pour l'organisation de, de ces événements euh, qui, qui, euh, qui ont un impact direct sur la promotion de la femme dans le monde. Et je tiens aussi à remercier euh, Dr. Hilly Omar pour son invitation. Je rappelle que Dr. Hilly, c'est le, conseil, le conseiller du directeur général de la Fédération des universités du monde euh, islamique. Alors, pour commencer mon intervention, je vais, je vais euh, parler de manière vraiment très succincte du système national de recherche et d'innovation euh, au Maroc. Et j'attends la projection. Il ne faut pas compter sur retard, sur retard madame. Next, next, please. Merci. 
Alors, le système national de la recherche et de l'innovation au Maroc, il est composé des instances et des institutions qui élaborent la politique gouvernementale en matière de recherche et d'innovation. Donc, je cite le Conseil supérieur de l'éducation, de la formation et de la recherche scientifique, le Conseil national de la recherche scientifique, l'Académie Hassan II des sciences techniques, le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche scientifique et de l'innovation et euh, quelques départements ministériels. Et puis, nous avons les institutions qui, euh, qui ont pour rôle la mise en œuvre de la politique nationale en matière de, de recherche. Donc, je cite le Centre national pour la recherche scientifique et technique, les universités publiques, l'université créée dans le cadre du partenariat public-privé ou les établissements d'enseignement supérieur non universitaire. Et puis, nous avons les structures de la valorisation de la recherche, les cités d'innovation, les, les offices de transfert de technologie euh, les, et les pôles technologiques. Et nous avons deux institu une institution et une instance d'évaluation de la recherche et de l'innovation, donc euh, l'ANIAC, l'Agence nationale d'évaluation et d'assurance qualité de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche scientifique, qui est sous tutelle du ministère de l'enseignement supérieur. Et nous avons l'instance INE, l'instance nationale d'évaluation qui relève des conseils supérieurs de la recherche de, des conseils supérieurs de l'éducation de la formation et le CNRST donc le centre national pour la recherche scientifique que j'ai l'honneur de, de diriger il est au cœur de ce système euh, national de recherche et c'est un pilier principal dans le, 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 la mise en œuvre de la politique gouvernementale en matière de recherche scientifique et d'innovation et notre rôle notre mission principale c'est la promotion la, 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 le développement et la valorisation de la recherche scientifique pour la communauté des euh, scientifiques. Alors, quelques indicateurs clés de la recherche euh, scientifique. Donc, nous avons 21 000, un peu plus de 21 000 enseignants-chercheurs, euh, euh, 792 structures de recherche euh, accréditées. Nous avons 40 000, euh, un peu plus que 40 000 euh, doctorants et 55 centres d'études doctorales accrédités par leurs propres universités. Donc, ce sont les statistiques de l'année universitaire 2021-2022. Euh, nos enseignants-chercheurs ont publié euh, un peu plus que 11 000 publications, dont 41 euh, en copublication avec des partenaires euh, étrangers. Et pour cette année, nous avons 4, 4 238 thèses soutenues, principalement donc, en sciences euh, dures, dans 53 et 47 en sciences humaines et sociales. Et euh, quant à le, au, au classement, donc nous avons euh, sept universités euh, qui sont classées parmi les meilleures 1200 universités du monde et nous avons six universités euh, parmi les 100 euh, universités classées dans le classement euh, QS de la région euh, arabe. Euh, notre publication scientifique a vraiment évolué depuis 2018 jusqu'à 2021 et en 2018 on était au 16e rang en Afrique et au 3e en, Ma en Maghreb et en 2021 on a gagné deux points donc on est au 4e rang en Afrique après l'Égypte, l'Afrique du Sud, le Nigeria et on est le premier euh, pour euh, le Maghreb. Euh, quelques chiffres sur euh, l'innovation. Donc, à propos de, de l'innovation, les indicateurs euh, clés sont le, les suivants. Euh, nous avons six cités de l'innovation qui sont affiliées aux universités publiques, 20 inc incubateurs. Euh, les universités euh, déposent euh, 155 euh, brevets par an, ce qui correspond à 61 de, de dépôts d'origine euh, marocaine. Et on a, euh, d'après le classement de Global Innovation Index, on est classé à la 60e euh, parmi les 132 économies dans ce classement. Et euh, on a injecté comme capital am amorçage des, 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 des risques euh, 111 millions euh, de, de dirhams investis dans des entreprises en phase d'amorçage. De, de, euh, Alors, toujours euh, à propos de Global Innovation Index et notre positionnement, euh, donc si on compare le comparable, donc... Euh, les, euh, si on se compare entre nous, hein, les pays à revenus intermédiaires inférieurs, et donc on est quand même classé à la sixième place euh, parmi les 32, donc euh, ce, ce qui est pour nous un, un bon classement. Et euh, le, le Maroc est considéré performant par rapport à son niveau de euh, développement. Maintenant, je passe à la place de femme, des femmes dans l'écosystème ESCI. Euh, le, le Maroc s'est engagé pendant plusieurs décennies dans des, des, des réformes de grande envergure euh, en faveur de la reconnaissance et la promotion de l'égalité des femmes et des hommes et la mise en place des mécanismes visant l'institutionnalisation de l'égalité euh, des genres. 
ces réformes ont nécessité des soubassements juridiques nationaux. Donc, euh, je cite la Constitution du 29 juillet 2011, l'adoption des, euh, des différentes lois organiques euh, et euh, de, de finances, donc les, ce qu'on appelle euh, les, les EOLES, et la loi cadre 51-17 relative à l'éducation, la formation et la recherche euh, au niveau de, de, de notre ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur, de la recherche scientifique et de l'innovation. Et euh, le Maroc, il a ratifié euh, pas mal de conven conventions et de, et, et de traités, donc les objectifs de des développement durable, euh, particulièrement l'acier défoncé, la Convention internationale pour l'élimination de, de toutes les formes de discrimination envers les femmes et des conventions de l'Organisation internationale du travail. Alors pour l'accès à l'enseignement, le taux de féminisation il est de 52,7%, donc euh, on a dépassé la, la parité. Pour le taux de féminisation du cycle normal, donc euh, quand je, je dis cycle normal, c'est-à-dire euh, licence, euh, master, euh, ingénieur ou docteur, donc, donc euh, la, 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 le taux le plus, le plus grand, c'est dans le, la, la médecine dentaire. Donc nous avons 71,4% euh, de, de taux de féminisation, euh, suivi par les sciences d'éducation, 70,7%. Et euh, le science et technique, donc, c'est 61,8%. Donc, nous avons un taux de féminisation, même par filière, qui est, euh, qui est grand. Alors, j'ai euh, oublié de mentionner, euh, pour les cités, de, les cités universitaires, donc, nous avons une capacité euh, de, de bénéficiaires femmes de 61%. Alors, à propos de, de l'encadrement euh, juridique, Monsieur le secrétaire général a parlé tout à l'heure. Donc, euh, le, le, nous sommes euh, dans l'université marocaine de manière générale. On, on ne représente que 32 alors que pour euh, l'encadrement euh, administratif, on est à 45 Alors, le, concernant les, les statistiques de, euh, pour les responsabilités au féminin, je vais parler que de, de, du CNRST, du Centre national pour la recherche scientifique et technique. Donc, nous avons 14 femmes responsables qui représentent euh, 33,3 Donc, nous avons euh, encore du travail à, à, à faire. Alors, à propos de, de la promotion de, de l'excellence, qui vise à encourager les, les meilleurs étudiants pour avoir des, des bourses d'excellence pour pouvoir euh, terminer leur, leur thèse de, de doctorat, on a un, un résultat fabuleux, c'est que euh, le taux il est élevé depuis 2017, donc jusqu'à 2022, on tourne autour donc, de 72-73%. Donc 72% en 2022 des bénéficiaires des bourses d'excellence sont des filles. Et à propos de, des programmes de recherche, nous avons de 2015 à 2021, nous avons 704 projets soutenus financièrement, mais malheureusement, nous n'avons que 17% des femmes qui déposent des projets et donc qui sont co coordonnatrices de ces projets. Et donc là, il y a des mesures qui ont été entreprises par, par le ministère pour, pour booster l'insertion de, de la femme et l'encourager à avoir des responsabilités. Euh, je vais parler que de l'institutionnalisation de l'approche genre à travers la création d'une cellule euh, chargée de la coordination, de l'évaluation et du suivi de la situation des femmes, des femmes dans l'enseignement supérieur. Mais en fait, euh, nous avons euh, six, six, six points euh, que vous le discutez tout à l'heure. Alors, à propos de, de, de l'entrepreneuriat... Euh, L'entrepreneuriat, qui dit entrepreneuriat au Maroc, euh, euh, dit euh, valorisation de, de, de la recherche automatiquement et euh, encourager les, les étudiants, les étudiantes à, à, à créer des entreprises pour que la recherche ait un impact direct sur euh, la création de, de la richesse. Alors, euh, la, euh, entre l'entrepreneuriat, la, la relation université-entreprise, plusieurs mesures ont été mises en place afin d'impulser euh, une bonne dynamique entrepreneuriale et de continuer le process de construire euh, un système d'entrepreneuriat performant, capable de participer à la création de la richesse et de générer davantage d'emplois euh, au Maroc. Alors, euh, d'après le, les résultats de, 
du, du, du programme GEM. Donc, euh, le, Maroc, le Maroc a une bonne performance et il a une bonne politique gouvernementale de soutien à l'entrepreneuriat. Et les conditions de base de l'entrepreneuriat au Maroc s'améliorent euh, de manière progressive. Alors, euh, à propos de, toujours de, de l'entrepreneuriat, nous avons euh, toujours ce rapport euh, GEM qui est un, un rapport euh, très, très intéressant. Donc, je vous invite à, à, à le décortiquer. Euh, alors, ce rapport, il, il évalue le niveau d'activité entrepreneuriale des hommes et des femmes pour euh, les, 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 sept économies, les 47 économies pardon, de, de, de GEM, donc, qui sont comptabilisées dans ce rapport. Et euh, donc, euh, les femmes sont plus susceptibles, donc les femmes marocaines sont plus susceptibles de créer une nouvelle entreprise. Donc l'intention des femmes, elle est là. Mais un autre résultat, c'est comme le, les, les hommes sont plus pro, 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 propriétaires d'entreprises établies que les femmes. Donc il y a un paradoxe, on a l'intention de, 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 de créer des entreprises, mais en fait... Euh, on ne les crée pas et c'est toujours euh, les hommes qui sont les, les, les euh, propriétaires des entreprises. Alors, pour, pour conclure, depuis son succession au trône, Sa Majesté Laurent Mohamed VI, que Dieu le glorifie, insiste toujours sur la nécessité que la femme marocaine apporte son plein concours dans tous les domaines, comme l'a illustré son discours à l'occasion du 23e anniversaire de la fête des trônes, euh, le 30 juillet 2022. Et sous son impulsion, le Maroc s'est engagé dans plusieurs réformes ambitieuses dans les six temps. Le code de la famille, la réforme du code pénal pour protéger les femmes victimes de violences, l'autonomisation institutionnelle pour garantir la présence des femmes aux différents niveaux de responsabilité dans des institutions constitutionnelles, exécutives, législatives, judiciaires et privées, l'amendement à la loi régissant des sociétés anonymes en déposant le principe d'une représentation équilibrée des femmes et des hommes dans les instances de gouvernance des entreprises. Quant à l'écosystème de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche scientifique et de l'innovation, notre ministère entreprend plusieurs actions et mesures en vue de renforcer la place de la femme dans le secteur en agissant à tous les niveaux, l'accès à l'enseignement supérieur, comme j'ai montré tout à l'heure, les conditions d'accueil, le recrutement, la responsabilité, les mesures spécifiques dans le cadre des programmes de soutien aux activités de R&D, d'innovation et d'entrepreneuriat. Et je vous remercie de votre attention. ont mis la présentation de l'activité. Donc, euh, bonjour, je tiens d'abord à remercier les organisateurs de m'avoir associé dans ce beau panel. Euh, je tourne le dos à Lise pour qu'elle ne m'arrête pas. <rire> je, je suis désolée, je passe en dernier, mais je crois que euh, je vais rester euh, dans la thématique de notre panel, euh, à savoir euh, la relation entre l'académie et l'industrie, et surtout comment, dans notre grande école euh, d'informatique, qui est euh, l'unique euh, grande école spécialisée euh, en informatique et dans le digital depuis 30 années, et j'ai eu le plaisir d'être la cofondatrice de cette grande école qui relève d'une université mère de l'université Mohamed V de Rabat, qui est l'université, la première université du royaume moderne, bien sûr, après l'université euh, de euh, euh, Fatima al-Kiriya. 
Voilà, donc euh, très rapidement, euh, pour rester dans les statistiques, euh, avant de présenter un peu tout ce que nous avons fait dans les innovations pour introduire et dynamiser l'entrepreneuriat au féminin, j'aimerais quand même vous apporter un éclairage sur la situation de la femme au Maroc en euh, nous, nous basant sur euh, l'Observatoire marocain euh, des très petites et moyennes entreprises qui a publié un rapport très intéressant, un tableau de bord en 2021 et qui a fait quand même une étude unique euh, exhaustive sur les euh, 616 000, plus de euh, 200 000 entreprises euh, pour évaluer un peu euh, la position de la femme euh, en entrepreneuriat euh, et euh, d'abord euh, en faisant aussi la typologie entre les, les entreprises personnes morales et personnes physiques. Et euh, voilà, donc euh, si vous permettez, euh, au Maroc, les résultats de cette étude démontrent que euh, uniquement 16,2% des entreprises qui sont actives et qui sont dirigées par des femmes et euh, dont le 25,5% sont des auto-entrepreneurs. Donc, euh, vous, vous imaginez bien que nous sommes en, encore en dessous des aspirations, sachant que la femme est un acteur de développement très important pour notre pays et pour notre continent. Euh, L'activité la, de la femme, euh, elle reste dans les micro-entreprises, à peine à 18%. À 18 et euh, les secteurs euh, d'activité qu'elle dirige sont à majorité euh, dans la santé humaine et l'action sociale, à 40%. Elle est à 32% dans toutes les autres activités de service et 30% dans l'enseignement, mais très, très peu dans euh, l'industrie et tous le, les bâtiments, c'est-à-dire tous les services qui génèrent de la richesse et qui développent le pays. Et donc... Euh, dans le monde, donc si on, le, on, on nous positionne par rapport au monde, euh, donc euh, le, la, les, les, les entreprises qui sont dirigées par la, les femmes représentent euh, un sur trois euh, donc des entreprises et euh, à dominance en Amérique, donc à 50 et vous allez trouver également dans les États fédérés de Micronésie à 87 dans la région MENA, ça varie entre 7 à 49 Le Maroc, il est à peine à 16,1 Et euh, les femmes qui, sont la, qui ont la proportion euh, de la population en emploi, c'est-à-dire euh, chef d'entreprise, nous sommes à peine à 0,8 à comparer avec l'Égypte qui est à euh, 8,6. Donc, tout ça... Euh, nous amène d'abord, euh, heureusement, que nous avons le nouveau modèle de développement qui vient justement avec ces trois leviers pour renforcer l'inclusion féminine dans l'activité économique. D'abord, il a commencé par lever les contraintes sociales qui limitent la participation des femmes en renforçant la protection sociale pour les femmes actives pendant les périodes de grossesse, des actions fortes en faveur de la parité sociale et de l'équité dans l'accès des opportunités d'emploi et bien sûr, les incitations fiscales en faveur des employeurs qui, justement, respectent la parité. Euh, notre modèle de, de développement a choisi également un deuxième levier qui est de renforcer les dispositifs d'éducation, de formation, d'insertion, d'accompagnement et de financement qui sont destinés aux femmes. Et le troisième levier, c'est comment assurer une tolérance zéro pour toute forme de violence et de discrimination à l'égard des femmes. Et justement, le nouveau modèle de développement s'est euh, fixé comme objectif d'augmenter, d'atteindre un taux de 45 à l'échelle de 2035 pour l'employabilité euh, euh, des femmes et l'entrepreneuriat. Alors, qu'a fait notre université et plus particulièrement notre école euh, Comme je disais, euh, euh, j'ai eu la chance d'être... Euh, euh, à l'université Mohamed V, vice-présidente pendant plus de 9 ans. Je suis également expert en réforme euh, internationale et euh, j'ai bénéficié quand même d'un capital euh, d'expérience, de retour d'expérience pour la dynamique de l'entrepreneuriat. Comment créer des ingénieurs euh, innovants, leaders, acteurs du changement et qui génèrent de la richesse pour le pays. Donc c'était ça notre priorité. Euh, euh, et c'est pour ça qu'on a commencé d'abord à faire un profilage 
quel est le profil du jeune entrepreneur innovateur C'est d'abord des jeunes entre 25 et 35 ans euh, qui ont donc cet âge pour créer l'entreprise. La majorité sont poussés par la créativité, l'innovation, le goût d'entreprendre. Ils sont motivés par l'aventure humaine et le goût du travail en équipe. Ils ont fait des études supérieures. Ils sont motivés par la réussite financière et sont inspirés par le besoin de rebondir. Mais ce profil-là, c'est le profil masculin. Et on a voulu également dresser le profil de l'entrepreneur femme. Et, qui est, et nous avons donc conclu que l'entrepreneur marocaine est relativement jeune, avec euh, une moyenne d'âge qui avoisine la quarantaine. Donc nous avons mené cette étude sur les 4000 euh, alumni, c'est-à-dire nos, nos lauréats euh, de, de l'école d'ingénieurs, donc euh, l'INSIAS, et qui a révélé donc ce profilage. Euh, la formation supérieure ayant moins euh, d'un membre de la famille entrepreneur et que les entreprises créées par les femmes sont généralement de petite et de moyenne taille et que malheureusement, les femmes entrepreneurs demeurent très peu actives dans les technologies de l'information et comme nous, nous notre euh, ADN, c'est donc euh, tout ce qui est transformation digitale, et bien sûr, accompagner le pays dans tout ce qui est différenciation de l'environnement euh, ultra concurrentiel, à savoir l'amélioration de l'expérience client, la cybersécurité, euh, la digitalisation des process, etc. Nous nous sommes posés avec nos partenaires, donc nous nous sommes réunis avec l'ensemble des partenaires socio-économiques pour faire toute une refonte de notre cycle d'ingénieurs en y introduisant justement une forte dose de créativité et d'innovation et d'entrepreneuriat et euh, qui nous a amené à repenser notre approche pédagogique, comme vous disiez, plutôt que de rester dans le transmissif, on s'est adapté pour que nos étudiants donc, euh, puissent être créateurs euh, dès l'entrée à l'école. Et c'est pour cela que nous avons mis en place plusieurs euh, ressources physiques, des espaces de coworking. Donc, on n'est plus dans la, la logique des classes, mais nous sommes dans des espaces de coworking. Nous avons créé également des Fab Labs académiques pour euh, 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 impulser l'innovation, la créativité. Et pour la relation entreprise, nous avons changé de paradigme. Au lieu que l'entreprise reste, euh, c'est-à-dire à la fin du parcours pour recruter nos ingénieurs, on, le, on les a impliqués dès le départ dans nos cursus en leur disant, eh bien, venez euh, participer dans l'accompagnement et euh, l'encadrement des chercheurs. Et je termine avec ça. Donc, l'innovation que nous avons créée dans notre cycle ingénieur, c'est que, au lieu, donc, c'est vrai qu'on a toujours eu le module d'entrepreneuriat, les activités parascolaires dans les clubs, etc., d'innovation, on a jugé que c'était très faible. Et donc, on a, on a introduit tout un parcours de bout en bout, depuis l'entrée de l'école jusqu'à la fin, pour justement leur introduire toute cette ingénierie de projet entrepreneurial. Et je vous ai parlé des tailles de contenu qu'on a travaillé avec nos partenaires, justement, pour impulser euh, euh, l'innovation et l'entrepreneuriat. Et, et donc, euh, voilà, donc, ces, ces parcours, l'originalité, c'est qu'on a introduit non seulement le parcours de l'ingénieur entrepreneur depuis la création, c'est-à-dire tout étudiant qui vient déjà avec un projet euh, personnel et professionnel, eh bien, on l'accompagne tout au long euh, avec l'écosystème que nous avons créé. Et nous avons également innové par l'introduction de l'alternance, et c'est ça le pont qui est avec l'industrie, euh, c'est que euh, au lieu que le séjour, comme vous, 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 vous l'avez dit, soit court en entreprise, eh bien, on a créé un séjour plus long de 18 mois par le principe de l'alternance, bien que l'alternance n'est pas encore institutionnalisée au niveau de notre euh, système académique. Et donc, euh, je vais conclure par ces recommandations, euh, parce que nous avons ce vécu, nous avons donc euh, estimé qu'il faut favoriser l'essaimage à partir des grands groupes, et tout ça, nous l'avons fait pour la femme, pour l'étudiante. Euh, pour vous donner un chiffre, nous sommes à 46 de, de filles ingénieures, mais malheureusement, leur, 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 leur employable, je veux dire, leur euh, création d'entreprise de, de, reste faible. Et donc, on, on recommande de, que les chercheurs soient très mobiles 
euh, entre le public et les privés. Donc, il ne faut pas que uniquement les, les étudiants qui se déplacent, mais nous, euh, on pense que c'est euh, euh, important que nos enseignants-chercheurs euh, fassent cette mobilité dans, dans le privé également et qu'il faut impulser une nouvelle dynamique dans les concours nationaux de création d'entreprises, de créer des bourses de création de start-up. C'est vrai qu'on a on fait des levées de fonds, mais sont très faibles si on veut vraiment dynamiser euh, la créativité. Et euh, l'incubation, il faut qu imp un, impérativement que la région euh, euh, s'implique euh, dans euh, le renforcement de l'incubation de, de nos jeunes si on veut justement euh, augmenter notre PIB. Et désolée si j'ai tardé, donc euh, vous êtes euh, les bienvenus euh, dans notre euh, chère école euh, d'ingénieurs. Euh, donc euh, euh, voilà, merci. Thank you all. Your, your presentations were fabulous, and I now have 127 questions to follow up with each of you, and 20 minutes. So um, what I'd like to do is ask a couple of questions here and then invite the audience to participate. And I'm going to try to combine my 127 questions into one or two. Um, one of the things I heard from several of you is that government policy is moving towards recognizing the importance of women as entrepreneurs and women in industry. Saudi Arabia is changing laws and policies. Morocco is changing laws and policies. But the problem remains, and I'm trying to remember who commented, maybe Abir, that there's still um, inhibitions that are self-imposed by culture. So, and so the part of that I think is so critical is for women especially to find mentors at the university who encourage them and guide them. Um, I heard a you know, several comments this morning about the importance and influence of mentors. And I wonder how, if, if anyone would like to comment about how do you encourage your faculty? How do you train your faculty and then encourage them to assume responsibility for mentoring individuals, especially young women? Thank you very much, Liz, for really holding a very tight ship. <laughs> so I'd like to comment about a very interesting phenomenon. So it's not mentorship that we need in university. It's really championship. We need people who speak on behalf of women. Because most of the time, decisions are made in rooms where there are no, women's, no women. And, and most of the time, decisions happen in very informal settings, very casual settings. So we, d we women should really work with our colleagues, men, men counterparts, on grooming new generation of, of champions, women champions, people who are in a decision-making situation, instead of listing five top men who can do the job, list a couple of women who also can do the job. We want someone who amplifies you, our voices, who, who makes these voices reach the right ears. So I think there is a huge, so when we speak about policy in general, policy could be as much as, as removing barriers, barriers, but however, policies could also play a role in the selection, in the nomination, in identifying the leads. So I would say it's the culture is a professional culture, not necessarily a social culture that we need to, to modify, that we need to actively work to modify to change how decisions are made. We spoke earlier this day in, in our casual chats during the networking hours about the white boy club, about how decisions are made when men meet rather than on the main formal table for decisions. 
when they go for games, for example, or whatever. So the idea of having a champion, someone who would actually amplify the voice of women is something we need. And we need to change the normalized, the male-dominated professional culture. Yeah, see, in the universities in uh, different parts of the world, and especially in Pakistan, now the Higher Education Commission has set up the Office of Research, Innovation, and Commercialization. So what I mentioned in my earlier uh, talk is, you know, like the faculty members who can serve as mentors for our young girls, they have to be trained. So the interaction with the industry, different industries, with the faculty, and what is the need of each faculty, what kind of trainings, et cetera, are to be provided to the students. I think first we have to have the faculty trained on them so that the faculty, when guides to the students, uh, they can give them those entrepreneurial skills, the soft skills, the uh, technical skills, so that they can be, you know, it can support them in their future entrepreneurial projects. Thank you. Yes, um, I think um, I agree with my colleagues. Championship, the, uh, training of the staff, also having uh, the right number published can catch uh, the attention of others and you can get uh, more support for that. Uh, in our survey, we in the, scroll in the uh, social uh, pillar, we had a survey. And some of the numbers were surprising to many. Uh, they did not think that it was like that. But when they saw the number, they are convinced. Yeah. So maybe measurements, maybe um, having uh, awareness in, in the university and outside, because they support each other. It's not just only university. Donc, je suis tout à fait d'accord par rapport au mentorat. D'ailleurs, c'est la raison pour laquelle nous, on a voulu donner confiance à la femme, parce qu'elle s'autocensure d'elle-même. Elle ne va pas aller chercher les fonds. Euh, elles ne concourent pas, donc euh, on les voit, c'est-à-dire que même quand elles sont en activité dans les clubs, elles ne sont jamais dans présidentes des clubs, elles sont toujours vice-présidentes ou chargées de communication. Et pour aller lever des fonds, elles montent les dossiers de sponsoring et elles ne vont jamais, elles, taper pour aller chercher. Et c'est ça, donc il faut leur donner cette, cette pulsion de faire ce premier pas, parce qu'elles elles sont leaders. De, de leur équipe, mais elles ne font pas, elles ne concrétisent pas leur, leur pas. Et c'est ce qu'on est en train d'essayer de, 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 de faire au niveau de l'université, c'est leur donner cette confiance. Et, et vu l'excellence, euh, vous savez, dans, nos, dans les chiffres, euh, les, les, la, la proportion des femmes euh, excellentes, euh, que ce soit au niveau du cycle doctoral, des masters, en ingénieur, dans tous les cycles, et donc il faudrait cette confiance Euh, et oser faire le premier pas de taper et d'aller chercher des fonds euh, pour se, je veux dire, s'affirmer. That was great. I, I agree with everything that's been said in response to Liz's wonderful question. I just want to add three uh, little ideas about mentors for undergraduate students. Um, one is um, uh, alumni, particularly young alumni, helping students prepare to, to look for that first job, to interview, to give them feedback about that. Another is in some uh, colleges I know do this where they have um, senior level uh, undergraduates in a session where they mentor first year students. And they've gone farther on that journey, and they, but they're still very close to it and they have really great advice and support to offer first year students. And the third is, um, in, at least in some cases, continuing to engage the internship supervisors for when students go out um, into the internships, let them continue that relationship. Uh, I was just told that we're going to have to conclude in five minutes because Morocco is about to finish their game and the streets will soon be blocked. So we're going to go very quickly to one, one more question and I'm going to ask people for very quick answers. So one of the things that struck me that uh, Jamila and Avir talked about, which confirms statistics from UNESCO, is that we have been successful in getting more women into university education, but they're still concentrated in very traditional fields like education and health that are usually low income and not necessarily income producing areas. Um, the question I have for you is really, what can be done to the early years of curriculum 
to encourage women to perhaps consider more, less traditional study and pursue less traditional studies to be more in technology and engineering and in business entrepreneurship. Um, we have an unusual representation here with mathematicians and engineers, but that's not typical of what women are studying for the most part around the world. So how do we change the curriculum to encourage more women? So I'm gonna give Yusra and, and um, Uh, rapidement, je vais revenir uh, à la première question, uh, seulement pour donner l'exemple du CNRST, parce qu'au CNRST, nous n'avons pas des étudiants, nous avons, pas des, nous avons des fonctionnaires. Et quand j'ai parlé tout à l'heure de 33% uh, des femmes responsables, en fait, c'est parce que les femmes, elles ne se présentent pas au concours. Et donc, c'est vraiment culturel. Ça veut dire qu'il faut vraiment encourager la femme, parce que le, le taux des femmes au CNRST, il est de 54%. Mais malgré ça, c'est des jeunes femmes qui ont des enfants à éduquer. Ils ont beaucoup de responsabilités et donc ils ne veulent pas ajouter la responsabilité au niveau euh, professionnel. Donc euh, c'est vraiment culturel. Donc euh, il faut qu'on fournisse beaucoup d'efforts pour euh, changer ça dans les mentalités de, de la femme marocaine. Alors à propos de, 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 du pourcentage que j'ai annoncé tout à l'heure, de, 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 du pourcentage des filières, en, en fait, euh, c'est pas... Euh, le choix n'est pas euh, parce que c'est une science d'éducation, c'est à faible revenu. Non, euh, là, c'est une comparaison et c'est une confirmation de l'excellence de, de la femme. Parce que euh, ces établissements, ça fait partie de ce qu'on les appelle, nous, euh, les établissements à accès régulé. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut être excellent pour pouvoir accéder. Et le premier pourcentage, c'est la faculté de médecine dentaire euh, qui, qui, qui demande euh, une note de 18 pour passer le concours. Et donc, il n'y a que les excellents. Et c'est pour ça que le pourcentage des femmes dans les facultés de médecine, il est élevé, il est de 83 Donc, en fait, la femme, elle est liée à l'excellence. Elle travaille beaucoup. D'ailleurs, c'est confirmé même par le, le taux de, de, des boursières. On a 73 pour l'année 2022. Que les boursières sont, sont des femmes. Donc, ils sont excellentes. Euh, et et c'est pour ça qu'ils qu sont dans ces universités, donc des facultés de, de médecine, facultés de, de, de médecine dentaire, et aussi dans les cycles d'ingénieurs. Voilà. And our final comment. First of all, well done, Morocco. So proud of you. Excellent. Okay, I will keep this short. For me, it's very much about role modeling. I think we can keep playing around with the curricula, but actually, we need role models. There was a study that was done with, I think, seven and eight-year-olds, and they were asked to draw a firefighter, a space person, whatever they're called, a spaceman, exactly, not a spaceman, a space person who goes into space, astronaut, thank you, that's the word, and um, a nurse and um, a teacher, and the drawings were very telling. Um, the astronaut and the firefighter were men, the nurse and the teacher were women. These kids cannot relate to jobs that they don't see role models in. We need to bring the female firefighters into the classrooms. We need to bring the female astronauts into the classrooms. We can fiddle around with the, with the curriculum. I'm sure it does need some fiddling around with, but actually nothing beats good role modeling. I know we don't see enough of those positive role models. We see it all over the world. So we need to be promoting you know, good action in that front. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Um, I want to um, thank my panel for being so respectful of time. And again, I apologize for rushing everyone because there was so much more to say, but the conversation was very rich. And I thank you all for your contributions. I also want to thank the hidden people back there who translate for us. You've all been really wonderful today. And nobody sees them, but we really need to applaud their effort. And